Hello, and welcome back to Big Red Journeys. I am your host, Big Red, and on today's journey, we are here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum, where we're gonna check out San Diego's connection to aeronautical history and space exploration. Inside the museum, you'll find a collection of decommissioned planes, models, artifacts from World War I and II, and including actual items from the Mercury and Apollo missions, including the actual command module from the Apollo 9 mission. So if you care to follow along with me on this journey, let's go. Entering into the San Diego Air and Space Museum, inside the Theodore Gildreth Flight Rotunda, we are greeted first off by a animatronic of the great famed pilot, Charles Lindbergh, standing right next to an actual working replica of the Spirit of St. Louis, which of course was manufactured here by Ryan Aeronautical here in San Diego. The Bell X-1. The first aircraft to go faster than the speed of sound. That barrier and that record was broken by the famous Chuck Yeager in October of 1947. And the Vin Fizz, which was actually the first plane to fly coast to coast across the US. This was done in 1911. special exhibit going on here at the museum is space our greatest adventure the history of, of space man's venture into the great beyond including an actual um, uh, capsule from Apollo 9 mission and of course some of the greatest things we have to be thankful for from not only going up into space and seeing the stars and planets was really some of the items that we have been able to uh, get for everyday life because of uh, scientific research done for planes, materials, uh, for rocket, for fuels and whatnot, including a handheld vacuum. Here's the different levels of the atmosphere. This is where you normally go when you're flying in a jet airliner, the troposphere, reach out to the stratosphere, which is about four to 12 miles above us, the mesosphere, 30 miles. As you can see here, this is where the meteors would start to break upon impact into our atmosphere, going up a little higher to the thermosphere at 52 miles, and then 62 miles would be what is called the Karman line. And that's essentially the de deviating line uh, to where space is considered to start. Sputnik 1, the satellite that the uh, Soviet Russians sent out on October 4th, 1957. One of the bravest little astronauts ever, Ham the Space Chimp. On January 31st, 1961, we sent this little cute guy up here into space for a quick little short, a short 16 minute flight before he was successfully and safely recovered as part of the Mercury program. And here is a replica of the capsule that Ham would have been in. You can see here the plastic, there's the seating right there, he'd be strapped down. He did have some simple functions to perform. You can see some, uh, some hand grips there. Some very cool artifacts here from uh, Commander w Wally Skyra of Apollo 7. Here's his actual Navy jacket. That's pretty cool. A seat strut from the actual Apollo 7 and signed by himself and some of the other crew members. An experimental helmet from the uh, Mercury days. Here you can actually see this is a inlay. It was never used in flight. But actually right there, that is a uh, kind of like an inlet hole for testing of intake of food and drink. A uh, coveralls worn by the crew on the Apollo 7 mission. 
and the uh, flag plan for the actual Gemini 6. And a NASA jumpsuit and jacket which was used for practicing only. This again belonged to Wally Skyra. What do humans need besides food and water to survive? Oxygen, of course. This is an identical oxygen tank to that of Apollo 13, which of course had the very famous leak, which of course caused that uh, mission to be a failure and forced those men to do what they can to survive and make it back home safely. Here is the prize piece of this exhibit, the actual command module from the Apollo 9 mission. Commanded by James McDivitt, Command Module Pilot David Scott, and Lunar Module Pilot Russell Schweiger. You can see the uh, the burn marks from re-entry, and look at the cramped quarters inside. Three grown men sitting on those uh, aluminum frames. The joystick. Look at all those switches as well, too. Crazy amount of switches. All had to be done in the correct order, correct positioning, all to make it home safely. Amazing. Right before splashdown, the parachutes would deploy from up top there. Usually they came in a, a pattern of three, and that was to prevent them just enough. So they had a safe re-entry into the water where they would get recovered by the Navy. An example of the Atlas D booster rockets. These were built by Atcha San Diego's own Convair company as part of the Mercury program. And here's an example of the very famed Saturn rockets. Everything below this point right here was just to break the atmosphere and get the men into space. The evolution of spacesuits here you can see uh, with the famed silver suits of the Mercury program. to an example of the Apollo suits. This one specifically worn uh, by Bill Alders in his preparation for his Apollo 8 mission. You can see the materials have gotten different, the inlet and outlet valves, locking mechanisms, even the helmet, quite different. There's a signed photo of famed astronaut Buzz Aldrin, the flag that was actually on Apollo 12. A uh, soil core temp uh, tube, which was used on the Apollo missions, an Apollo 11 pin. Definitely seen better days. An example of how corn chowder would have appeared in a sack during the Apollo 11 mission. A uh, replica of the actual Apollo 11 plaque, the one that was left on the moon by the astronauts upon that famed landing. And this is very amazing. This is the ALSRC or the Apollo Lunar Sample Return Container. This is the actual one that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin brought back that carried the very first samples of moon rocks from the Sea of Tranquility. Here is a signed photo of the crew from the Apollo 11 mission. Obviously, of course, the commander, Neil Armstrong, command module pilot, Michael Collins, and lunar module pilot, Buzz Aldrin. The actual front tire from the... Uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis, flight from April 8, 2002. That tire right there, it's one of these right here. Interesting. Scale model of the Curiosity Mars rover. Only see it on TV, and to be honest with you, this is huge. I didn't think it was this big, to be honest. Here's the tires. Just amazing. To give you an idea, this is me standing next to it. And this portion right here is still above my head. An actual piece of moon rock. Brought back to Earth by the Apollo 17 mission. The Air and Space Museum is separated into a few sections, starting with the first examples of aviation history, such as the mono wings and bi wings, similar to the Wright brothers. Um, World War I plane, wait a minute. 
including the most famous pilot ever, the Great Flying Ace, Snoopy. Probably more so popular due to this little beagle right here, but no plane really represents World War I better than the Fulker Der One. Most famously by the Red Baron. The triple wing design is unmistakable, but nothing compares to a good old doghouse. I really love the theming here at the Air and Space Museum, specifically on these uh, this older exhibit about World War I era planes and whatnot. Got some uh, original campaign posters, the walls, even a uh, military setup tent. A hot air balloon that would have been used for scouting and reconnaissance right there. You can see the uh, gentleman right there. It looks like he has a map in front with some binoculars and some radio wear. And some memorabilia pieces from the First Great War. Including some Royal Flying Corps medals and badges. And these ones in particular belonging to Brigadier General Billy Mitchell. Medal of Honor, Distinguished Service Cross, the Single Service Medal, Spanish War Service, and the list goes on and on. And of course, the U.S. had their own great ace, Eddie Rickenbacker, who flew out with the RAF in France, and of course was the uh, great nemesis to the Red Baron. And speaking of, there's a portrait of the two men, Manfred von Victoven. Credited with over 80 kills during his time in World War I. He was the theater's leading ace. Originally part of the cavalry, he transferred to the air service and flew as an observer before being sent to flight school. Some pretty amazing memorabilia pieces here. These are actual insignias that were from the original fabrics off of some World War I planes. This one in particular is of the Kiki Mules of the 95, 95th Aero Squadron. The 94th Aero Squadron had in the ring. Okay. The era of the Barnstormer. Some people consider this quite the golden age of flying as a recreationalist and even professionals started to make their own planes, make advancements in machinery. And the Barnstormers, people who would actually do uh, tricks, stunts in the air, including this gentleman right here who looks like he's about to go from a moving vehicle onto a low flying plane. San Diego strong flying connection grows with PSA, which was a uh, smaller airline, started in 1949. Their vision was to compete with the big boys, but still provide double the service. PSA was actually around for a couple decades up until 1988. We have a full-size replica of the Lockheed Vega 5B, most famously flown across the Atlantic by Amelia Earhart and she became the first woman to cross the Atlantic solo. We also have a few pieces of her collection here including a shirt that she wore as she was changing the oil on one of her planes. Uh, you can actually see some oil stains. It's kind of hard to tell on camera but there's a few darker circles towards the front. You see a few books that she wrote and what I consider pretty cool this flag, this 48 star flag, was tucked into her fur lined flying suit during her historic transatlantic flight on June 17, 1928. And right there, it's hard to make out, but it is her actual signature. So during the uh, Pan American Exposition that occurred here in the 1930s in Balboa Park, this building was actually created by the Ford Motor Company to advertise their new vehicles, especially the introduction of their very powerful 
V8 engine. And what I find so interesting about this is this fountain, which is going to be a little hard to tell, but I don't know if you can see. We have the V going this way, and then we have the round portion of the bottom part of the A, and then right past the water fountain is a smaller figure to make up the V8 logo a Ford. The dome was not here originally, so the intent was that planes flying into the airport, which would fly right across and up in the sky there, would be able to see the giant V8 logo down here. Another plane that holds a strong San Diego significance, an F4U Corsair, flown by Marine pilot, baseball legend, radio legend, Padre legend, San Diego legend, Lieutenant Colonel Jerry Coleman. Let's take a look here. And there's the good man himself. Take a look of the cockpit, instrument panel, his seats, and the uh, foldable wings, which obviously were meant to fit as many of these planes available in the uh, uh, aircraft carriers as they went out to missions. Entering into the pilot's ready room, an example aboard US warships where the pilots would prepare for their missions get their briefings, flight deck control, where commanding officers will be. Let's go check it out. FA-18A Hornets, made famous by the Blue Angels. The Blue Angels, of course, come from the Navy and are a performance group that fly these F-A-18 Hornets around the world. And an example of a uh, military-style drone. They're actually much larger than I thought they would be in real life. And for those who are uh, eager enough, adventurous enough, there's two levels of simulators here. The uh, more calm, mundane version here with a cool little 3D motion simulator uh, chair. Or the really cool ones here where it's almost like a roller coaster style. Strap yourself in and go for a ride. And as all good journeys do, they end at the gift store. So of course had to end the trip off with a little sweetness. Got the astronaut Neapolitan ice cream sandwich. So let's give this a try and see what it really does taste like to be an astronaut trying to eat some ice cream in space. It's wrapped up very similar to a uh, traditional ice cream sandwich, but definitely no moisture in there. In fact, when we unopen it, you can see the strawberry, the vanilla, and the chocolate, but they're kind of in a uh, similar consistency to what I would say like a graham cracker. So. To be honest, it's not that bad. It's actually pretty good. You can taste the strawberry, the strawberry section right now. And it tastes kind of like, the consistency is very similar to like a wafer candy, like those Neko wafers. It's very chalky, but the flavor is there. And even the chocolate, it just, the chocolate tastes like a chocolate graham cracker. Not bad. Well, that is going to do it for today's journey here at the San Diego Air and Space Museum. Learning about the history of flight, the connection with San Diego and aeronautics and the space program was just great. If you're new to the channel and you like what you saw, first of all, give this video a big thumbs up. Second, subscribe and take your journey to the next level by also hitting that notification bell. That way you'll be notified whenever there's a new video that comes across on the channel. And as always, feel free to follow me on Instagram at Big Red Journeys where I'm going to be taking you along on other places, theme parks, museums, all throughout Southern California and beyond. From me to you, thank you, and I'll see you on the next journey. Bye.